the Ford 8.8. I absolutely love this rear axle. I love this diff. I love this configuration. I love this availability. I love everything about this thing. Not to mention, I love how easy it is to work on. Now, easy is a point of view based on the person doing the job, but we here at TFS like to make this as easy as possible for anybody doing the job, and that's what we're going to knock out today. So of course, before we get to narrowing this rear axle, we actually have to disassemble it. So the complete teardown of it begins with removing everything that is essentially, well, bolted or stuck to it. Now, if you are going to pick one of these up from the yard, it is highly recommended that you pick it up with two right side axles and purchase it with the two right side axles. And of course, we'll get into the reasons why and all the rest of that good stuff later. But disassembly pretty quick. In just a moment, I'll show you how to get the axles out. Now first you need to locate the bolt for the spider cross pin and this has got an 8mm head on it and you simply just take it out until the threads are loose. You can pull it a little bit just to pull it out of there and get it ready to uh, remove. Slide your hand underneath it, get some pressure on the spider pin itself and pull it out through the top. Then you can rotate it around, push in on the axle and you'll see the C-clip is revealed from the C-clip retainer. All you have to do is get in there with like a little screwdriver or something like that and pop it out. As soon as it comes out, slide the axle out of there. Now don't forget to go back and actually remove the C-clip from the differential housing in the event that it fell out through there. You definitely don't want to forget about it, have it get stuck, lose it later, or anything like that. All right. Teardown is pretty much complete. That was relatively easy to do. In fact, it was extremely easy to do because, well, it's an easy diff to work on. Now, a couple of things I'm gonna point out. This gear set inside of here and this entire differential, bearings, plates, LSD, the whole works is going to be rebuilt by us as soon as we get this thing narrowed. So at this present time, I'm not going to worry about this being left open. But if you are worried about it being left open, go ahead and put your differential plate or your cover plate back on here to try and cover it and keep most of the dust out of it. However, do note that, that you are going to be cutting and slicing on these axle tubes and these uh, axle tube housings are actually left open. So you're not gonna keep all the dust and dirt and debris out of it. You're still going to need to clean it. Now on the uh, Fabrication Series website, on the build blog, we do have uh, a concoction of what we call differential soup, which is nothing more than warm water and a degreaser that once this is all assembled, I fill it back up here and let it soak for a while, then clean it back out so that way it flushes out all the dirt and debris. You can read up on that one if you want to. Make sure you check the description uh, for the links below here. But that's one thing that I'm going to note on here. If you don't want to you know, worry about destroying it or anything like that, cover it back up. The second thing, it was not necessary to actually pull off the backing plates and the brake shoe assemblies. It wasn't necessary, but it does make it easier in this case because I have these uh, tabs that I have to actually cut off of here. And with that backing plate here, it was, it was limiting the accessibility for it. So I just went ahead and removed those. Plus it makes it a little less bulky and a little bit less difficult to work on when I have this section here that's going to be cut down. So with all of that out of the way, it's time for the full on strip down, which means we're gonna grab a hold of a paint marker and a grinder and cut all of this stuff off of here. Let's get on it. So like many of us, I do not have a plasma cutter or a smoke wrench readily accessible here in my shop. So we're going to have to go a little primitive style and we're going to have to grab a hold of the cutoff wheel on the end of a grinder. So usually this doesn't mean you have to actually trace all this stuff out, but you know what? It helps me kind of guide my way through as I'm grinding, even with the experience that I have. So I like to grab a hold of a paint marker and I like to mark out where I'm actually going to cut. Now, it makes great difficulty trying to make a cutoff wheel go around a radius like this. And in fact, it's more likely to explode if you attempt to do that. So we're going to attempt to make straight cuts. Now, back to uh, the old days of the TFS here. You know, we know that we can always take metal away. We can't necessarily put it back on. So a good old fashioned straight cut with a cutoff wheel to remove the bulk. And the rest of it will come off with our flap disc. Now, if you're using a plasma cutter or a torch or smoke wrench or any of those things there, you know, the 
spot this is in the grinder is still gonna have to do the exact same thing so one thing I like to do is make a good straight cut across the top to divide it in two pieces. Then I'm going to slice up one side, slice up the other side, slice the bottom, slice the top, whatever remains. We'll come off with a grinder. I'll do the exact same thing to all of these tabs. That is a lot of grinding dust, but you know what? At least the tabs are off of it, but I did keep a couple of them in place. One of them is here, the other one is here. Both of these hold the metallic brake line or the brake hard line. They hold it in place. I wanted to keep those in here just in case we ever have to use them again in the future, but the entire tube is cleaned off, smoothed, and of course I did focus all of my area and making sure that it's nice and clean in this section. Now we do have some gouging that we have to deal with, but we'll worry about that when we're welding. There is some gouging left over from where we cut into it and we cut the tabs off of it. And there's also some gouging in some of these areas where it's a little bit like an undercut from the actual weld that the factory laid down on it. So if we want a nice smooth tube, we'll have to go in there and chase those out and then grind it smooth again. Now before we actually get to measuring and cutting this tube down, we're going to go in and prep another section of it, which is actually the actual tubes to the housing itself. Now when it comes to narrowing the 8.8, there are typically two methods that people use. One of them involves cutting out all of these plugs in the axle housing or the differential housing, cutting the tube down, throwing it back in there, realigning it, and welding these tubes back up again, or at least putting these plugs back through. That's a very daunting task. I've done it before, and I don't recommend that anybody kind of chases it that way unless you are just absolutely gung-ho about doing it. There is a simpler method, and that's the one that we're going to do, which involves cutting this tube, a section out of it, welding it back together after realigning it, and it becomes shorter. It's pretty simple. So since we are going to rely upon this method of actually sectioning this uh, left side tube here, we're going to actually strengthen this housing because in some instances, racing, off-road, etc., these plug welds here can actually break, which causes the axle tube to spin inside of it. So what we want to do is actually weld the tube to the housing itself. Now since this is regular mild steel and this is cast, there's something that we really got to do, and that is clean it exceptionally well before we go welding it. That's what we're going to get on right now. Now, if you look closely into one of these things, you'll actually see that there's a bit of a gap that sits between the actual differential housing and the axle tube itself. But all you really need to do to get this cleaned out of here is just grab a hold of a really good heavy knotted wire wheel and dig it in there and make sure it's bright and shiny as soon as you're finished. That's it. Tubes are prepped, housing is prepped, one last little squirt of acetone in here, chase out any kind of extra particulates, uh, grinding dust, anything that might wedge itself in between this housing because there is a bit of a gap 
and that's something that we really need to take care of here. Make sure it's nice and clean and prepped and ready to roll. Now, this is pretty much set. We are ready to actually chop this tube down after I get me and this workstation cleaned up because this is a complete disaster. Okay, I feel much, much better now. Feels like I can work. Now, I'll be honest with you, we still have more cutting, more grinding, more everything else like that to do, but I'm a little bit tired of it at this moment, so I'm going to switch it up, and I'm going to do some welding just to kind of, uh, I don't know, take a break from all the cut and grind work. I mean, that's, uh, that's annoying. Now, one thing we should mention real quick, though, is if you are unable to TIG weld, or if you are going to leave a fat weld on here, something like from a MIG welder, or maybe even a stick welder, or anything like that, if you are not able to keep this lip when you are finished, you should probably wait to do this step. Either way, we're going to tackle welding these axle tubes up to the axle or differential housing. Now, notice we have two dissimilar metals here. We have regular carbon mild steel, if you will, and we have something that is cast. Cast iron, cast steel, cast whatever you want to call it. We don't really know exactly what it is. Now, we can grind and spark test, or we can Google a bunch and all the rest of that stuff. But... 14 times I have done this rear diff and I have found only one filler metal when it comes to TIG welding that has successfully welded these two together without ever cracking. And that is 309 stainless filler rod. Sounds a little weird or counterintuitive to, you know, because you're welding mild steels or whatever, but 309 is one of the best things I have found to weld these two dissimilar metals together and hold. So, if you disagree with my choice of filler rod, that's fine. Use whatever it is in your arsenal that you feel is best, whether it be a stick electrode, different MIG wire, different TIG wire, special alloy content, filler construction, composition, whatever the case is. Use whatever it is that works best for you. At the end of the day, technically there is no right or wrong as long as the result is correct. And if the result is a fully welded piece that is not cracked, that's what we want. That's correct. So, moving on here, we don't have a whole lot of worry about distortion on this one from the factory, or at least in the factory form. It takes several thousand pounds to actually press this tube inside of this axle housing, and we have three plug welds that are triangulated, so we don't have to worry too much about distortion as it pulling one way or the other. But, we do have to remember that we are pumping a bunch of heat into this steel tube and into this actual housing right here. So we have to kind of be careful with that one. To help minimize distortion, or the potential for distortion, we're going to tack them in quadrants. As in, we're going to go from 12 o'clock, then 6 o'clock, 3 o'clock, then 9 o'clock. After those are on there, we're going to weld in quadrants. So we'll go, since I'm right-handed on this one, we'll go from 3 o'clock to 12 o'clock, then we'll go 9 o'clock to 6 o'clock, and then we'll oppose them each time that we go around there, all the way around. I'm going to do that on both sides. Okay, you know what I think? I think that, that nice little welding break to uh, get these axle tubes up to this housing was not nearly long enough, because now we have no choice but to get back onto this left side axle and start chopping it all apart. Now, very important here, do not skip through this episode. Make sure you are paying attention. These measurements, these cuts, this fit up is crucial to ensuring that this axle housing or this axle tube actually stays straight and goes down the road without cooking bearings every mile. So make sure that you're paying attention. Do not skip through this episode. Let's get on it. Now, one of the most unique characteristics of the Ford 8.8 is that one axle tube on the left side is actually longer than the axle tube on the right side, which means if we measure the two of them, 
calculate the difference, we can subtract that difference out of the left side tube, weld it back together, and then stick an extra right side axle into this side, thus making the entire thing more narrow and fitting into more vehicles with that same bulletproof awesomeness and versatility and ease of fixing and repairing and being cheap and all the rest of that good stuff that we mentioned before. But either way, what we need to do is find two reference points that are exactly the same on each side. And this is what I typically choose to use, is the outside edge of this differential housing and the outside edge of the mounting surface for the rear caliper and the, the uh, brake shoe assembly and backing plate and all the rest of that good stuff. The reason I choose the outside edge as opposed to the inside edge is the outside edge is machined flat. It is nice and even, has a good, crisp, sharp edge on it. So that means that that reference point, when we measure across here to here, the same on both sides, we're going to get very close, accurate measurements. Now, this is the point where you want to be extremely picky and honest about what you read because the tape measure or whatever measurement device you use does not lie. Your eyes and your brain do. So, place it on the inside, measure to the outside edge. Here I have 17 and 3 eighths of an inch. So I'm going to go to the, end, the opposite side. There I also have 17 and 3 eighths of an inch. Let's try the top. Also 17 and 3 eighths. Now if we want to flip this up here, measure out the bottom side. Also 17 and 3 eighths of an inch. Now we'll go to this side. Measure out the top. Looks like we're dead on at 20 and a quarter. Back side. Also 20 and a quarter. And inside also 20 and a quarter. We flip it up and make sure that this is also true for the bottom side. Also 20 and a quarter. So if we take 20 and a quarter and we subtract 17 and 3 eighths of an inch, we get 2 and 7 eighths of an inch difference. So 2 and 7 eighths of an inch needs to come out of this axle housing so we can weld it back together. Pretty simple. Now let's identify the area that we need to cut out of here. Now right off the get-go we can look at this and we know that the axle actually tapers down from three and a quarter inch OD down to whatever this is, probably three inch right on the nose or somewhere in that area. So we definitely cannot work with anything from here out. Not going to happen. No cutting and welding there. Over here we have our axle or our brake hardline tab. Right here we have our vent tube and over here we might not have enough space to actually weld all this back together. Not to mention I don't want to have a whole lot of heat concentrated in this area and not to mention if we have all of our weight of the vehicle or everything focused on the outside of it, the stress load increases on the inside of it, meaning it's basically going to want to put a lot more uh, work onto the inside of the tube here where that weld would be. So this area, not going to use that. Anything inside of here, not going to use that. That means that we have everything inside between here and here. Now this is where it gets kind of uh, clever. I get a little bit picky about this one. You'll have to pretty much know or anticipate where the axle is going to sit or where the components that you're going to use is going to sit. Now if you're going to use something like a leaf spring rear end or something like that, remember that the U-bolts will most likely be coming up and over this. So you want to anticipate or measure your chassis before you actually cut this to make sure that you don't put a U-bolt directly on a weld or something like that that's going to cause more pressure and stresses on it. You definitely do not want to have anything down on this. You can actually place it between the U-bolts or uh, maybe on the outside or close to the inside of it or somewhere in that general area, that's where you want it. And you also, if uh, in this case, this car is going to get a four link uh, when we stuff it into the chassis that we're using it for. So we want to make sure that we don't have our welds and everything else landing right on that zone. We can have it in between, we can have it a little more to the outside, we can have a little more to the inside of where that bracket is. Now I've already measured that one out and we're not going to get too far into it because it'll, it'll probably be a little bit more confusing than it has to be. And this video is supposed to be very simplified. So. In this section right inside of here, I'm going to take some measurements real quick and figure out exactly where I want to place my weld, and then we'll just get on to uh, cutting it out and getting it all set up. Now, after very careful consideration, I've decided to start my cut, or the section where it's actually the weld is going to be located, is at 9 inches. So I'm going to measure around this tube in every single section very carefully, measure out 9 inches, and put just a little tiny mark on it. I'm going to go all the way around the tube as soon as I move this jack stand so I don't remove the paint that I just laid down on there. So again, working my way all the way around the tube from the inside of that axle housing right on that edge. Just make sure that we make a mark nice and even 
on each side. Now once you have your cut lines actually marked out, use some masking tape to create a visual edge for those cut lines. Make sure that it lines up nice and straight. Each edge from where you started and where you finished needs to be exactly the same. Now grab a hold of a ruler or something with a better scale on it so you can more accurately measure. Measure your cut distance, in this case it's 2 and 7 eighths of an inch. Make a mark all the way around that tube. Make as many marks as you need for a good visual reference. Now go ahead and grab a hold of the masking tape once again and do the exact same thing. Make sure that all of your lines and all of your references line up right at the edge of that visual reference, which is the masking tape. Now, if you're a little bit over either one of these lines, that's really okay. And the reason why is because if we remember the golden rule of metal, we can always take metal away, but we can't necessarily always put it back on. So, with that in mind, if you're a little more on the inside or anything like that, you should be fine. But if you're past this point or past these edges, you may be in some trouble. So make sure that you cut a little bit more on the inside and a little less focus toward the edge there because we can always grind it out to make sure that we're sitting right where we need to be. I'm going to take a measurement again across this tape surface just to make sure that we're not way off or way over or anything like that. So far everything is lining up right where it needs to be. There's nothing that's standing out here and screaming at me saying that uh, I need to take it off and redo it. But in the event that something is not lining up right or you have some significant difference in your measurements, take it off, remeasure, redo it. Be picky because if you screw this up, you could just, you know, scrap the entire thing. So make sure that you're very, very picky about your measurements. Go over it two or three times if you have to. Make sure. There's nothing wrong with doing that. I'm going to flip it up here and I'm going to measure the other side just to make sure. Everything's looking good. All right, we're ready to start cutting. Now to make this a little bit easier to follow, we've divided it into two separate episodes. Now to see part two where we actually cut the tube down, stick it all back together, click right there. It'll take you straight over. We'll see you there.